Ford workshop um, hosted by the Student Success Center. This is our last workshop of the academic semester. So the goal today for this workshop is to really talk about failure. How do we deal with it? What are the um, benefits, but also what are some of the cons, I guess pros and cons to failure? How do we um, grow? How do we learn? What's the success look like to us? And so we're going to have a holistic approach uh, to failure. We're going to talk through how does it affect the mind? How does it affect the body? And how does it affect the spirit? And so right now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel. So I have Dr. Cole. He is our provost. So he's here. And then this is Julie Cole. She is the director of Campus Life. We have Dr. Rhonda Davis, who is the VP of Enrollment Management. We have Danelle Mason, who is our AD for Student Engagement. And we have one of our beloved student workers, uh, peer tutor extraordinaire, Morgan. Um, and so all of them are here to just really talk to you guys. We want this to be a conversation. Each person on this panel is incredible. They have great wisdom um, and they want to give you an honest approach to how to navigate this area of life. So I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer and then we'll get started. Father, I just thank you for this time. Um, Holy Spirit, we just invite you in. We invite you in. May these words be your words. And I just pray that those who are joining us live, but also will watch it recorded, that they really just hear more of your heart, that their identity is wrapped in you, um, and that there's just a new level of healing and wholeness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so the first thing I just want to ask for whoever on the panel wants to go first and break the ice. Um, is how do we fail forward? How do we fail forward? So big <laughs> we like to deep dive. How do you fail forward? I think failing forward is um, not allowing failure to keep you stuck. So you, the opposite of that would be to go backward or to even stay where you are. So you fail forward by learning, by moving from failure in a direction. I think for me, failing forward has been giving myself permission to fail mm -hmm. um, and knowing that it doesn't have to define me, that I can learn from it and I can grow from it. I think, oh, no, I'm so sorry. The, I think just to add on what was Ju Julie was saying is that I think also it's defining what failure truly is. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times it's, you start off with an expectation of yourself and if that's not met or if somebody else places that expectation on you and you don't meet that, then you fail. But that's not necessarily truth, especially when you know who you are and whose you are, of course, which I'm sure we'll get into. But I think that it's important to define what failure truly is before you can decide if you're moving forward or backward from that point. What do you think is, if I could use the word scary about failure? What is so scary about the word failure? I think with failure comes this idea of identity and we attach it to ourselves rather than it being an experience that allows us to learn and grow um, past it. We allow it to become part of us and who we are. I think that's what's so scary about it. Yeah, I think it's, um scary because it can feel permanent yeah. it's like if it's, it's not just that i had a bad day or a bad week or a bad course it's it's that i own this becomes a part of me and i don't see any way out so failure can can make me think that it's time to quit um so i think what's the opposite of failure for me it's success and what is success it's not quitting um so i think that's true and the other element always for me. I'm, I'm an expert on failure. High school, <laughs> college, graduate school, doctor. I've failed at every level. Um, uh, but um, for me, failure is often tied to fear of rejection. Yeah. Uh, it's the humiliation associated with failure that I own, which makes me want to quit. So if I can be honest about that, then uh, I can get to uh, a more balanced perspective on it and keep moving forward. I think it's an unknown of response. You know, how are people going to respond to me? Does this mean I'm unworthy of trying again? You know, there's just this unknown that comes. Am I going to fail every time now? Yeah. And it creates a perspective, almost this this mindset of every single time this is what's going to happen. There's this repercussion, almost this gut feeling if you're a feeler. You know, you just have this sweaty. 
education. So how do you deal with that in academics since this is higher ed, we have a lot of students watching. Um, what would be maybe an experience you've had in higher ed where you failed? I mean, let's say you studied for that exam, you failed, or you wrote that paper and you thought it was the best thing in the world, and it's all red, you failed. <laughs> how do you deal with that? And, and maybe what was your experience to have that? I think looking back um, personally for me, looking at my undergraduate experience, I really struggled with that transition from high school learning into college learning. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also really, I had different desires rather than academic performance. I wanted to thrive socially, which was something that didn't happen for me in high school. So I wasn't involved. And so I wanted to be involved in college. And so I started struggling with this time management aspect of, oh, I want to be on SGA and I want to be in programming and I want to do this and sorority life and all of that. And the next thing I you know, it's like, wait, how do I manage my time? And so um, it was ironic the other day I was looking at my undergraduate transcripts and I was like, wow, that's pretty bad. You did <laughs> real bad in that. And, you know, when I came out of that experience, I graduated, I, I made it, I got the degree. But when I look at that, you know, I could sit there and analyze the fact that I failed. Um, but what I choose to remember is that my senior year, I was on the dean's list both semesters. I finally realized kind of what the reason for me being there was, and I prioritized what was important about that time while still giving myself grace to live my life and not just focus on the books. And so fast forward into my graduate studies, you know, it definitely redefined what failure looked like for me and, and what I was focusing on. And so I think I think there's a lot of times that we put so much pressure. Again, it's that definition of failure. We put so much pressure on the expectations that we have on ourselves. And I remember, it, I thought I was going to make it, I think a B. I don't probably remember. I thought I was going to make my first. I was so excited. I was going through grad school and I was making great grades for the first time. And I was like, oh no, now I'm going to make a B. And so I had to redefine failure as now making something other than an A, other than being perfection. And so I really had to sit down and remind myself, why am I here and why am I doing this? Is it really for a letter or a number or is it because the Lord's called me to learn? And sometimes learning has a different outcome than what our grade is. So I, don't, I think I really went in a really big circle there, but I hope that made sense. Yeah, I think for me, I'm a senior this year, so at the tail end of my undergrad experience. And I think I realized that feedback, I, I learned so much more through feedback than I do through the first attempt. Like that is where true learning comes for me is the second attempt and getting that grade back from the professor and being able to correct myself for the next time. So allowing myself to like have the grace of like, okay, this is my first try. You know, we talk about the first paper of the semester and how much anxiety we can weigh on ourselves. Um, and I think I just have to tell myself, okay, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know this professor's expectations. So I have to give myself like the grace and also the motivation to be able to just do my best and just turn it in and get it done. And then I can correct myself afterwards and really get that feedback. So I think Danelle, you probably hit on this, but how do you deal with perfection versus excellence? what is the guide and marker stuff for you to know, okay, I'm actually striving and I'm trying to be a perfectionist or actually I'm working towards excellence. How do we know if that's what we're doing? When I was in seminary in, in grad school, I had um, this professor, Dr. McGee, Gary McGee, and I wrote my first grad paper for him and I turned it into him and he gave it back to me with a note that just said me in my office. And so I went to his office. I was really scared of him also. So that was a side note because he was just so brilliant and I really admired and respected him. But I went into his office and I sat down and he said, Rhonda, you made an A minus on this paper, but I'm not going to record the grade until you do it again. And I was like, well, that's so mean, you know, I just, why would you do that? I'm fine with that. And he was like, because just because you can write correctly, like you correctly formatted the paper or whatever, I think there's more that you have to say. So this isn't your best work. And I'm going to tell you before you get too far down the road. And he wouldn't record it until I 
had done a lot of work and really said, um, he's like, this is great. You've regurgitated all of this. I really want to know what's in there, what's in you about this subject. And he made me better. So it really shifted the way I looked at all of my um, work from that point. And it became like, yeah, okay, I can get and understand the mechanics of this assignment and check all of those boxes. But am I really, like you were saying, am I really taking in and learning and turning that into something that's worth giving back out? So it was, so excellence for me became something different. I would have been okay to settle for that A minus, but he knew there was something different in me. And I was so mad at him at the time and never wanted to see him again. But I, he changed my whole academic trajectory with that one little 20 minute conversation in his office. So I don't know, that was an experience that I had um, that caused me to start asking myself different questions. Yeah. Great professor too. <laughs> yeah, right, great professor. Yes. Push you in that direction. Yeah. Um, I guess just going along those lines, how do we take in constructive feedback? I think that that would be, you know, how do you take that in where it's not, I might be getting ahead of myself for the identity part, but how do you take that in, in your mindset of, I want to pursue excellence, I want to not fail, I want to succeed, but what if the constructive feedback I receive seems like a failure? How would you process that? Or is there a situation where you had that and there was a better outcome? Yeah. I had a situation like Rhonda, only the professors weren't as, um, Encouraging. Uh, I was sitting for my senior paper defense and I had done the basics. I did a project and I wrote a paper on the project, but it was weak on research. And the professors that were um, there at the defense knew the kind of work that I could do. And they just said, This isn't, this isn't acceptable. This isn't, this isn't what you usually do. It, it felt horrible. Mm -hmm. And I left and went in the bathroom and just sobbed and sobbed. They were kind because they knew what I could do. They gave me an incomplete rather than an F. So I got um, another um, few weeks to finish it. And I did and I finished well. But um, how it was delivered left me to um, learn the lesson from. And, and I eventually did, but it was, I felt very sore on the inside, <laughs> like something had happened, you know, like, oh, you know, it, it, it was a wound. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good segue into the rejection component mm -hmm. of failure. Um, it's, it's natural, it's human nature. You're going to receive it and receive it as rejection. But how do you balance back up with that? For me, um, I would, I think, take those inventories and they always call me a perfectionist, which is kind of humorous, but I think I understand it. Um, <clears throat> but I think as I look at my academic life, I was such a perfectionist <clears throat> that I honestly didn't believe I could write a good enough paper to be acceptable to the instructor. So that would lead me to fear the rejection from the instructor ahead of time. So I would procrastinate and I would you know, at three in the morning, throw this thing together and turn it in. So I got it in on time or I would turn it in late and I may end up turning in a decent paper, but it gets this low grade because of the deductions. Um, but it was all because uh, I had this, I must have had some really mean grade school teachers or something, uh, but I but I really uh, had this thing about um, the, the public humiliation that I would suffer from the rejection of these brilliant people mm -hmm. uh, that, that would not have any confidence that my work was acceptable. So I had to overcome that and start deciding that excellence for me is just doing the assignment and turning it in. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, coming to the play, you know, if, if you're afraid you're going to strike out and you won't go up to the, to the batter's box, you failed because you didn't try. But if, but if you go up there and give it, um, whatever you're able to do, in spite of your limitations, um, that's success. And, and I think excellence is is what you're striving for. And if you're striving for excellence, that in itself is a quality of excellence. Uh, and you know, performances come and go as, as you grow older. But um, the yeah, the rejection um, 
was a non-starter for me until I decided I, I had to actually you know, have enough courage to overcome those moments. Good. I think this is a great way to tie it, the, the mind component of what you just said. This is a, a practical takeaway of how am I perceiving it? What is my perception? What is my motivator? What is this fear? A fear of thinking I'm already rejected because somehow I've already rejected myself. Um, so I think these are really great things for all of us to think about when we're approaching failure. In academia, it's very obvious to see if something is a quote-unquote failure by the book. Um, and so just to encourage you students, uh, ask yourself those questions, those introspective questions of where is that motivation? Who told me that? And then I guess maybe on the Christian perspective, where did you hear that line? You know, and, and work with the Holy Spirit to begin to uproot that line um, and maybe find a faculty member or a peer member who can encourage you through uh, this pathway, especially as we're finding and coming up with those things. So that leads me to our next topic, which is focusing on how failure um, and stress in these things can manifest in our bodies. And so I think we all have had a point in time where we realize, okay, I'm human, and I may say I'm not stressed out, but my body is literally carrying the stress, and I can't handle it. So as we move into this body component, I just want to start with this question. Um, what are the physical manifestations of stress and overworking, and what are the signs to look for? So this can apply to you as a student, maybe in your work life, your uh, home life, but if anyone wants to start, what are some signs of stress and overworking? I have quite a few that just show up in me personally, and most of the people in this room would probably even know because I've shared them, and it's pretty hysterical how random they are, but um, you know, for me, there's certain things. I, I am the kind of person I will hold it all in and hold it all in and hold it all in. And inside of my body, there will be this whirlwind of stress that's happening. But I'm not necessarily showing it. I'm just fine. And I feel like I'm managing everything fine. And then, like, I start to notice what's happening in my body. I'm like, wow, I am so not okay. But for me, that's definitely, like, I'll experience hair loss pretty badly. Um, I get blisters on my hands. I, they have an actual name. I can't remember what they're called, but they're these tiny little blisters that show up on my finger. And then I also have some oral issues from grinding and TMJ. And when I start noticing those more prevalently, it's like, okay, I need to take a hot minute back and realize what's going on. And, you know, I think, I think it's important to know that sometimes – different stages in our life doesn't necessarily give us a relief from the stress. Sometimes we can't stop, you know, that whirlwind that's happening. You know, if you're working on a degree and you have a family and you also have a job, you may not be able to say, oh, there's something I'm going to put on the back burner for right now. But you just have to take the time and assess your body. Um, you know, like what are those movies when like the robots or whatever would go into the machine and they figure out there's a part of them that's not functioning properly. It's kind of like every once in a while you have to do that and go take that check from the neck up and say, okay, what can I do in this moment, this right now, to provide myself a little bit of relief until I can push through to the end? I'm still staring at Janelle. <laughs> I was like, was there more? I was supposed to say complete that. <laughs> I think that's good. What about burnout in general? Um, if someone can explain maybe what burnout is and where are the signs? How do we deal with burnout? Well, I was going to say, yes, I'm a counselor. And so um, what fuels me, what makes me tick is I love connecting with people. I care about their pain. Um, I pray about that. I carry that. I release it to the Lord. But sometimes there's seasons like 2020 where just about everybody you meet is going through a lot of crud mm -hmm. and you honestly care about it, but more and more gets <laughs> piled on you. And the way it comes out of me is I, I am a gut person. And so I just start feeling really numb or heavy down there. And I'm not sure why, because so much has been pushed down that I haven't filtered through that for me, I just need to get away somewhere quiet and um, let it settle and then maybe one or two things will become clear and then it starts to un, you know I can untangle it from there uh, but so much of what my work is setting my own stuff aside to be there for the other person which I love to do but when I do that too much I lose I lose myself 
I lose a touch with myself and I get really numb. I think it's good introspection. That's the word that keeps coming to my mind. And that's just asking yourself those questions and knowing your boundaries. And sometimes with failure, you learn your boundaries pretty quickly. You learn what you can and cannot handle. And then you create almost a script of encouragement for yourself, like reminding yourself over and over, okay, this and this. So I guess really when it comes to the body, you know, we, we hold the stress, we feel it, but what's a practical way? How do you turn around from it? Like Julie, I think you just began that, but maybe some of our other panelists, how do you deal with that? How do you have a healthy coping skill with the stress? That's the word I'm looking for, coping skills. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, um, when I was younger, I, I'm a recovering people pleaser. So, you know, that has been my struggle lifelong. But when I was younger and in elementary and middle school, I used to have a lot of anxiety about making good grades. And there was one moment where I was really stressed out about this one paper and I I was just crying. And my mom was like, okay, you can cry about this right now, but at some point you're gonna have to get it done. So allow yourself the physical release of crying because um, in psychology, we kind of learn that our body holds trauma in different ways. So whatever, like, it's going to come out some way, whether it's sideways in, like, anger or whether it's a good release in, like, crying and that kind of thing. So um, my mom, she said, okay, you can cry now and give yourself that time, but then you have to go forward and finish the job, get the job done. Um, so for me, as as a student, as work, like, as I'm working, as I'm do juggling all of these different things, I have to give myself the space where I can process those feelings, process like the emotional response, and then I can go back to this. And it's it's a lot less of like juggling the things at the same time. Um, and it's a lot more of like compartmentalizing my life a little bit um, so that I can process things well. Like sophisticated research shows that if you sit uh, in front of a computer screen for 10 or 12 hours a day, every day for like two weeks, you get burned out. Um, true. So simple little things for me are just get up and go for a walk. Yes. Get up and get some fresh yes. air and um, see the sunlight, yes. a little bit of blue sky if there is any, and just take a break from the monotony. Well, we, I think we burn out because we, we, we just lose all sense of, of the need to, to prioritize margin. Yeah, yeah. And so how do we how do we pace things out a little bit? So just a little bit of rest during the day. And then, you know, uh, Sabbath principle every week, take some time on a weekend. Every month, take a, take a full day. Once every three or six months, take a weekend. But do, do things that recharge your batteries or, or else burnout is inevitable. Yeah, to all my fellow students out there, do not read while eating. Don't do it. It's not good. It's not good for your course, coursework or for your digestion. Like, just don't do it. Allow yourself some breaks. Yeah. As we were talking um, as a team before this workshop, we talked a lot about just walking and going outside. And it's simple things like that. I mean, so, so simple. Just do it for yourself. Um, so maybe if there's a park, getting that vitamin D, just finding those practical, simple ways to get that stress off of your body. Um, and I think just honoring yourself too. Of, it's okay that I feel this. There's a reason why my body is telling me, hey, something's going on. I need you to deal with this. And so finding those ways to just slow down, deal with what's going on. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no failure for feeling a failure <laughs> um, in that sense. So I think we hit on rest, but tell me if we can just eat for some of the panel, what does rest mean to you? And what does it look like practically? So we'll start with Morgan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think right now in, in this current season, um, it's just allowing myself to be myself and not performing for anyone else, not performing for professors or my parents or anyone in my life, just allowing myself to sit with who I am and to sit with who God is and just being present. I think that's where I felt the most stressed. I, 
I guess being candid, I, I'm still figuring that out, honestly. I still very much struggle with an overcoming people pleaser myself and being a tad bit performance based. And so I'm actually in a season where I'm really trying to understand what boundaries look like in my life to where I can have that rest. Um, you know, practically speaking, I love reading a good book. That's a way for me to really recharge, even if it's just a fictional something Rhonda recommends. It just helps me to um, escape for a minute, you know, even if it's in bed for 30 minutes before I fall asleep, which normally means it's like two hours until I fall asleep because I can't put it down. But um, for me, it kind of removes me from myself for a minute and helps me to enjoy another situation. Um, I am a mother, so just fully immersing myself in my time with my son is a way that I definitely recharge because he sees me in a way that I can never see myself. And so I try to see myself through his eyes for a little bit. Um, you know, but I, something Morgan said really stuck with me, but that compartmentalization of my life is kind of the way that I was able to find rest because then I was able to find time to be just me and not be the worker, not be the wife, not be the mother, not be the student, but just to be, I'm Danelle. And so I'm going to take that time that I'm compartmentalizing for myself and I'm going to rest in this time. And so for me personally, it looks different every time I do it, but I just try to make sure that in that schedule, there's Danelle. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not very good at slowing. I, I like to be act, I'm an active person. I like to be active. I like for there to be activity around me. But I have found that rest comes to me too when I'm able to um, join the Lord in some type of creative work, um, which sometimes looks like, you know, maybe it's some kind of creative effort. I make something or I work on something or I, dig in the dirt a little bit or, you know, usually for me, I'm doing something with my body, but I'm replenishing myself to um, even just regular rhythms um, of, of health and spiritual health, the way I come to the Lord. And that is a learn, that is a discipline for me to be retained, um, but I've learned that those rhythms replenish me in a way. So it doesn't necessarily mean sometimes we think about rest, it's just we stop everything and sit and that's that's not very helpful for me in fact i feel like even thinking about that i'm like oh. <laughs> you know i so i found that i can find the lord and be replenished as i go about doing you know i know that i'm burning out when i'm not thinking creative thoughts i know i'm burning out when i can no longer celebrate things i know that is a sign to me that oh, you're you're out of whack you know so so leaning into those opportunities, you know, I like to make things with my hands or work on things or projects or um, celebrating something, you know, going to get donuts with my son or something like that, that replenishes my soul. Um, I'm not having to think or make decisions necessarily, but I am, I am bringing rest to my mind and, and my body. So, yeah. Gosh, everybody's said everything. Mine's not good. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is both right. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I feel at peace with myself, yeah. when I feel comfortable in my own skin, and that happens most when um, I'm doing things I enjoy. I love to take walks. I like to use my brain when it doesn't, when I don't have to make a decision, or I, I like crosswords. I like, mm -hmm. you know, word puzzles, things like that, where I can, like, it doesn't, the world isn't going to end if I don't get this three down answer. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's okay. It's just fun to challenge myself. I do like to, I used to like to dig in the dirt when things would grow in my dirt, but <laughs> you know, things that feel just like, this is just fun. Yeah. That, that's rest for me. For me, the word is simplify. <clears throat> um, I'm going to make a statement. You don't have to agree. We can agree to disagree, but um, I think, um, Multitasking can be a trap, it can be a lie. Yes. Um, there, it, it becomes a drivenness and you become a slave to other people and other things. So for me, simplifying means recognizing I can actually only do one thing at a time. So why mentally am I trying to do five things at a time? And when I do that, I'm only giving 20% of my energies toward the one thing I should be focused on. So uh, simplifying, which means um, uh, 
staying away from social media. Um, those texts or those emails do not have to be responded to real time, 24 seven. Those people don't need to hear from me at 11 o'clock at night. Um, so simplifying my life so that whatever I'm deciding to do, I can be devoted to. And then those other things, they're on the list. They, they can be prioritized and they're, they're, their moment's going to come in my life, uh, but but uh, I'm 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 at rest when I have uh, allowed that simplicity to really guide me. They're all really great. <laughs> I'm taking some of this in myself <laughs> because I am I like to stay busy. Probably <laughs> I'm tired sometimes. So thank you guys for sharing it and sharing how to do rest and what that looks like. And sometimes it is under development <laughs> as we're learning and we're growing. So the next aspect I want to focus on as we're getting close to concluding is spirit. How does failure, and so when we say spirit, that obviously means as Christians, our faith, but also our identity, because that goes hand in hand with spirit. So um, the first thing I want to ask you guys is, can you speak to the role of identity and how it plays into failure? And truly, like, I'll stop it. Just how does it play into failure? I can do that. <laughs> um, I grew up in a family where um, it was around the television ministry and the message I got just as I, I probably took it in it was never told to me is if you want God to use you you got to look pretty perfect you got to act pretty perfect and so I, I took that in with my body image and the way that I performed at school and I was able to keep that up uh, really until I graduated college and got married and went to graduate school. And to me, what I've learned about failure is failure is just coming to the end of yourself. And it's a gift from God. And what I was carrying was a burden that I wasn't meant to carry, which was be perfect, look perfect. Uh, and when I got to graduate school and we had an unexpected pregnancy and we were dealing with financial situations, I mean, everything just hit the fan. Um, I realized I can't do this anymore can't do this anymore. So I just started um, going to counseling, working through my stuff, trying to do what I could for graduate school. And I was in graduate school to be a licensed marriage family therapist. And so I went for my practicum. Um, I applied for a very prestigious practicum. And I saw the lineup of people that were trying out for it, you know. And so one of the questions they asked me is, what's your grade point average? And it was not four point anymore. <laughs> because I just had life and I tried to do the best I could do and I shared and I left and I thought, well, I didn't get it. And I found out later that I did. And he told me the reason you got it is because you do not have a four point. He said, we want people that know how to live life and be balanced. And I just thought, that is God yeah. <laughs> telling me that it's okay for me to just be me, that I have something to offer, understanding what it's like to not be able to do it all. So the fact that I wasn't perfect got me my first counseling job. <laughs> and it was just the Lord saying, see, you know, yeah, learning to fail can be a good thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think when we take in, uh, just like you're saying, all the expectations around us. And um, I know that was, I grew up in a, in a family of achievers. And it was good in that it has always, you know, kind of been an engine that motivated me to keep going and to not give up, you know, quit was real bad, like nobody. <laughs> um, so that was the ultimate failure, you know, but um, taking all of those expectations like you're talking about over time made my soul very sick um, because I had convinced myself um, to believe a lie that if something didn't happen, it was because I didn't try hard enough or I wasn't, I didn't give the right answer or I hadn't impressed the right person or on and on and on and on the list may go. So I think our, our soul, our, our spirit can just become sick, you know, with um, what we have believed, you know, the lies that we have believed, the expectations that we have taken on and we convince ourselves that somehow we can work ourselves out of ever experiencing the pain of failure. And so I love what you said about failure is when you come to the end of yourself. I think that's so true and power comes and we should know and experience this as spiritual believers that ultimately 
the best gift that God has given to us is um, knowledge that we don't have everything it takes. So again, I would just say um, it can failure or that or the anticipation of failure, even more than the failure itself, can make us soul sick and to where we become unable to let our soul really speak to the Lord and really, you know, say what we want to say to God and be fully who we are. And we're, we, we start to present ourselves in some kind of way to the Lord, like he doesn't really know who we are. And so it's, I think, the, the, regular, um, the regular attention to my humanity and bringing that to the Lord that can be kind of the antidote to this fear or a failure or the expectation of failure. Now, I haven't mastered that altogether, but when I come to the Lord regularly and say, I'm bringing this to you at who I am to you, do with it what you will. You know, or I, I want, you know, I want to invite you in, you know, and invite the spirit's perspective. That sickness can be reversed, I think. So, anyway. Yeah, I think, uh, as I've said before, I have experienced several moments of failure where it, like, it caused a lot of, like, emotional response, like a big emotional reaction. And I've learned, okay, like, dig deeper past those emotions. What do they actually mean? And what do they, what does it mean to me in that, like, are there lies that I'm believing that cause that emotional response? And what have I tied my identity to, um, to where that, that is what, that is how I react. Um, so for me, I think whenever I've experienced failure, it's always come out like, I've had this emotional response, and so I have to dig past that and realize, okay, this is something that I've tied my identity to that my identity is not meant to be placed in. Um, and so I think failure has become this like moment of shedding these like false selves that I put on, like on top, it sounds weird, but on top of like my true self to where I, I place my identity in other people's opinions or my grade point average or my ability to do a lot of things at once and juggle a lot of things. Um, and each time I've like failed in whatever aspect of my life, it's always been a moment where God is just shedding those things off. And in that shedding, it's been a closer communion with God because there's nothing standing in the way anymore. Um, and so yeah, like if you're experiencing failure right now, just see it as an opportunity for God to come closer to you because you're you're not at arm's length anymore. You're you're at, down on your knees because you're being humbled too, which is very hard, but it's it's good. <laughs> and I think yeah, the beauty and the irony is higher education represents that. It's yes, we're learning, but learning is unlearning. So there's going to be failure, there's going to be success, there's going to be a myriad of things. And we don't come into higher education thinking we've already got it figured out. Yeah. We come in knowing we're going to keep learning. And really, I've learned that I don't know anything. <laughs> and I'm always learning. So I think it goes back to that perspective. Um, but you guys did an excellent job of getting so many of the questions that we have in general. But let's talk a little bit about giving yourself permission to what does that look like for anyone on the panel? How do you give yourself permission to embrace, quote unquote, what is a failure um, for you in your life? I think we probably have all gone through, um, especially in this season, like this COVID season yeah. is kind of what I first think of. You know, I think we've all gone through some kind of feeling of failure, you know, whether that be academically or whether it be just in your personal life in some manner, professional life. And I mean, I remember, uh, the personal story of, you know, it was, I think, probably April of last semester. I was coming up on the end of my master's degree. I have a two-year-old little boy. I have a husband. We're taking an entire campus life program online. And I just remember one night looking at my husband and not even knowing if I had spoke to him all day, not knowing if I had even shown him any attention. Um, and I 
just, I, I started crying um, very heavily and I was just like, I'm so sorry. I'm failing at every identity that I've attached to myself. I am not being, a, you know, I'm giving 20% of myself to every aspect of my life. And I remember him looking at me and him just saying, but that's not what you're doing. You're actually excelling in every area of life in the, the dealt, like that, that hand that you've been dealt. We've all been dealt such a unique situation right now. And I'm sure through everyone's story, you have a season of your life, even outside of COVID, that you've had this unique, you know, hand of cards that's been dealt with you and you have to figure out how to navigate that. And so, you know, I did grieve, but in the same sense, it was like, actually, it is kind of cool to look at this season and be like, maybe it isn't 20% I'm giving, you know, maybe the Lord has given me that extra ounce of strength to actually give more of myself to each of this season, because this is a learning season. Um, and so I think it is like Morgan has said, it's so important that you grieve, but I kind of, I keep going back and having this statement in my mind of really defining what failure is and really taking that time to introspectively look at what does failure mean to you and where did you get that definition from? Um, because even as Julie said, it's like coming to the end of yourself. And really, that is what happened to me. I, I couldn't do it anymore. And here I am thinking I'm feeling that the Lord is succeeding through me. Um, and so I think grieving, yes. Yeah, cry. Please cry. Because if you don't, then you get blisters on your hand. And you got to go in the machine and get like that analysis done of yourself. You know, like don't don't cry. If you need to cry, you need to go and walk through those things. But you know, grieving can also look like introspection for a minute and just figuring out what that looks like. And so, you know, I think we've talked, there's so much around failure that you can say it's other people's expectations, it's other people's definitions of certain things in your life. But a lot of this, if you just take some time to sit down and be like, what is this to me? You're going to have a very different response than you thought you did going into that process. Um, so yeah, I think definitely cry and do the things, but also look at what does grieving mean to you. And I think that means coming to the end of yourself and redefining what you're going to do moving forward. Two words come to my mind when you ask that grieving question. One is the word community. It's, we have the Lord and we need to embrace the Lord and seek him. And he's always there, but it's hard to grieve in isolation. So we need each other. We need community. We, so, but, but to be in community requires honesty. I need to. I need to share with somebody else what I have been through and what I'm going through. And the scary thing is they might not respond in the way that I dream they ought to respond to console me and help heal me. But actually when I choose to share honestly what I've been through, um, I'm trusting the Lord. It's not because they're going to perform well and heal me. It's because I'm choosing community so I'm not isolated so I can get through it in a healthier way. The other word is just the word contentment. Scripture says godliness with contentment is great gain. And, and I really think that my situation right now may not be ideal. It may involve a lot of failure. It may be very mediocre. It may not be fun. It may be depressing at times. But I'm, I'm called to something right now in and of itself. But that very thing is also an apprenticeship for me from the Lord. The Lord is preparing me for a future assignment. So even if how I get through the season right now is pretty average. If I can trust the Lord to use that in my life, knowing that he's got something in mind for me a little bit further down the road, I can be content. I can be content with, with just not quitting, putting one foot in front of the other every single day, and, and knowing that the Lord is building something in me that he's going to use in redemptive ways further down the road. Well, guys, I want to honor our time. I could listen to everyone on this panel all day. This is such a good wisdom and advice. Um, I think just to wrap it up, if everyone could, what is one way that you can embrace failure to propel forward? And I think Dr. Cole kind of led that segue, but I just each person, if you just want to share, how do I embrace failure to propel forward? I already won. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would be processing a failure so that I can learn the lessons from it. I, well, I, I talked about my gut. I could hold it in here and feel like I'm a failure, but if I talk about it or write it out, find some way to get it out and then learn the lesson from it. That's the way I am available. Yeah. Um, I think I just, I would say just acknowledge it quickly. You know, um, this happened. Yep. Like when I acknowledge it, 
just like you're saying, when I acknowledge it, I can put it in its right place and then I can move forward from it instead of just sitting there and letting it define. So I would say I try to fail forward by spotting failure as quick as I can. <laughs> I think, I feel like I've kind of said it, but in the same way for me, I think I start by defining what that failure was to me and why I'm identifying it as a failure. You know, if it's academics and you made that grade, obviously, you know, there's an assessment that needs to be done with that. And I think in that you're able to have an honest conversation with your professor about where that stemmed from, you know, was it my writing ability? Was it the facts that I was providing, you know, that kind of a situation. And, but if, it, if it's kind of personal life, professional life mixed with some academia, I think for me, I defined that someone put an expectation on me that I, um, that isn't truth or did I not meet? Does that make sense? So kind of figuring that out and from there then processing it and being able to move forward and learn from that. Because if you stay stuck in it, um, you really, I mean, you're stuck. And so I think kind of like just continuing, because I also love what Dr. Cole said about, I mean, you think about your story and your testimony and even those personal failures that may or may not have happened in your life, the Lord will use those yes. later. Um, so it's just really processing the whole thing out, exactly what everyone's saying, so that it can be used. Yeah, I think for me, it is just realizing that what I'm experiencing now is transforming me into who I will become in the future. And so partnering with God and asking him, okay, what are you going to use this for? What are you trying to do in me um, so that I can better glorify you and, you know, be the person that you created me to be? Um, so, yeah. I, I think, too, being able to find and understand and invite resources for the next step, like, I, it, it's okay, I can identify failure, okay, move on, and then I, I have to do the same thing again. I'm gonna need help, I need to grow in my deficiencies or my areas of weakness, right? So identifying what resources are in front of me, who can speak into this, who can help me, how can I, you know, just holding all of those things that I would like to think are perfect about myself very loosely and inviting other voices, you know, to learn. So I learn, I adjust, I move forward, we see what happens next. Uh, just to add that community element, it's just really important not to fail alone. <laughs> and you also have success with other people, so not doing it alone. It's important having the right people to spot those things that's needed in your life and be open to receive it. You know, yes. we have to receive that from the Lord and let's be open to receive that from other people that we admire. Um, and so I think this is great. Thank you everyone for sharing. I really appreciate you guys. Um, this was just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> I know that we all have so much more to share. So um, just know we have more workshops, workshops like this for the next semester coming down the pipeline. Thank you guys for joining us in person and here online. This will be uh, on YouTube, on our TKU Student Success channel. Got to make a plug, subscribe, you know. Um, <laughs> and this should be there by the next day. So you will see that up live. Again, thank you guys. I also just wanted to make another plug. This is the Campus Life team, most of this. So please know that Campus Life is here for you. And so email, email them, reach out, come in person. But there's such a great tool for pastoral care for just support in general, for campus support, having community. So please make sure you plug in. Student success, we've got you on the academic side, but Campus Life also has you with community. So thank you guys for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day.